Hi, hi everyone. Thank you, Tanya. I shed a little tear then. That made me feel really good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm very excited to be here and do this webinar with Corel and I hope that you all enjoy this and maybe pick up some tips from it. So I'll just start jumping in. Um, now I'm going to show you my process when creating a like a movie poster for advertising, that sort of thing. And to start with, I'll show you the steps that I take and then at the end of it, I'll do some painting, some um, show you how I apply texture to the end of my painting with the thick, art, thick um, paint brushes. So, yep. I hope you can all see my screen okay. Everything is looking good and you have lots of um, people saying hello to you, Michelle. Oh, <laughs> hello everyone. <laughs> I'm interested to know where everyone comes from. Oh my gosh, well I, I can let you know we have an extremely large registration group today and they are from all over the world but um, oh. I'm happy to share information with you after. <laughs> yeah that'd serious. be great. Okay. <laughs> okay when I start anything a project that's quite big like this I'll make a mood board get some ideas together just grab a few images to um, just get a bit of inspiration and get the ideas flowing. And so that was my mood board. This is a poster about Maleficent. It's not for any movie or anything else. It's just a mock-up poster that I'm just doing for the webinar. And then my first step actually painting or actually drawing. I'll start with thumbnail sketches. So it's really loose, fast, just really getting some ideas down and deciding which one I wanted to go with. And a few of them are quite, you know, I liked it. I like the idea of them, but in the end, I like the, I just like the um, atmosphere, the pose. It felt very vulnerable to me, which is what I wanted to show. And we all know Maleficent's a bit of a hard ass. Oh, sorry, she's a bit of a hardy. And yeah, I just wanted to show a softer side of her and when she was most vulnerable. Sorry, I don't know if this is the best way to do it. I just thought it was, if I had 50 million things open, it would have been too hard going through them all. So now I refine the sketch. I've chosen which thumbnail I like the best and I've gone in and I've refined a sketch. It would have started with a looser sketch and this is sort of my last base sketch. It will change a lot from here still, as you'll see. But um, yeah, that's my starting point. If I'm talking too quickly, just let me know if you need me to slow down. And sorry, I've got a really bad cold at the moment so my voice is really husky. Everything is good but I have a question. Um, sure. What kind of tablet are you using? That's one of the top questions we always get. Yeah I'm using a Cintiq 24 HD Touch which I was lucky to get a few years ago for a job that I did. Very nice. And it, it's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I mean, it's older now compared to the newer tablets that are out, but it works fine. It's really great. Mm -hmm. But I used to use, before that, I used a little bamboo, Wacom bamboo tablet, and it was wonderful. I actually sent it to one of my kids that I mentor a bit, and he's in Ghana, and he didn't have access to any tablets or anything like that, so I sent him my old bamboo tablet. And he still uses that now. So that's a pretty good plug for Wacom, I think, because it's a really old tablet. Yeah, that's amazing. Those tablets, they do last forever. I have some 
probably from 10 plus years ago, and they're still kicking. Yeah, they're amazing. I'm a definite Wacom customer. I don't like the competition tablets. I did have one. I had a Unova. It was a screen tablet, but it was it was so cheap and nasty. And I know that sounds awful, but it really was. And I had nothing but trouble with it. So straight back to Wacom I went. Well, they will but. love that plug. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do anything for Wacom. I was ne um, one of the next level um, artists a couple of years ago in their next level exhibition. Um, but besides that, I don't do any work with Wacom. So it's not a plug for them. It's just my preference. Okay. Now, once I've got my sketch, I use a big round hard brush or a square brush and I just get some values down so I can get an idea of where I'm going to go with lighting. Well, not so much lighting yet, but pardon me, with just the values. Make sure that my focal point is defined quite well and yep, go from there. It's also good to have a base and each one's on it. This is a JPEG, but when I'm working on it, each element has its own layer so that then I can add a layer on top of it, select the subject on the bottom layer, and then I'll go make a marquee of it. Um, sorry, I'll just grab my pen. Um, I'll select it and I'll create a marquee. I'll hide the marquee. This is my shortcuts panel. Um, so I'll hide the marquee, add a layer on top, and then I can just work on top of it without having to worry about going outside the lines or anything like that. I don't know if other people use other software, generally you can use Clipping Mask to do that, but you can still do the same thing here in, in Painter without having to use a Clipping Mask. You just select the actual element so, oh no, sorry, wrong pen. I don't know why it does that. When I use the other pen, it goes out of whack. Um, it's not going to let me do it because it's on a layer. I'll show you that after. I won't worry about it now. I'll show you when I can show you. Um, anyway, so I lay down those flat values just to get a good idea and get a base so that I can work on top of each element. I hope you understand what I was saying then because I totally mucked that up. Now I've gone a little bit further here and added some lighting and shadows. It's not completely done, but just to get an idea of where I want the lighting, where I want it to come from, how it's going to affect the whole illustration, because that's really important. And everything that I do when I'm doing a project like this, I'll do roughs for. So this is the rough lighting. We'll get to the rough colours like colour palette later on. Any questions or anything, I'm happy to answer them at the moment. Okay. Um, I'm trying to find, somebody was asking, they're curious about your brush palette. Sure. For whatever reason, I've lost track of the person that asked. There's a lot of information coming in in the questions panel, just so you all know. Um, yeah, but I think it was a general question. And sure. I have this that you also sell brushes, or you have some portrait brushes for painter. I know. Yeah, I've got kind of a few brush sets for painter. Mm -hmm. I've got concept, concept brushes, blenders. Um, portrait brushes that I sell in my store on Cube Brush. 
the palette that I've made here for the webinar, I've just pulled out all the brushes that I used in it so that I could show everyone. Some of them are mine out of my sets and some of them are painted generic brushes like the flat colour brush. That's in the um, fast and simple category. That's a great brush to do your bases. It's the best brush. It's basically a hard round brush. Um, yeah, the blocking brush is one of my brushes, the square blocking, and that's my go-to brush for everything. It's got a bit of texture to it and it's a really, really nice brush to block in everything with. The rest of the brushes, I'll sort of go through them later once I've finished showing the slides for each step. Before I start painting, I'll show, I'll show you the brushes and what they do, if that, if anyone wants to see that, maybe. Yeah, that sounds perfect, because there, there are questions coming in related to how do I see commands for resizing my brush or rotating the canvas, and we can save those. Yep, no worries. To be honest, I don't use commands. I don't use a keyboard because my keyboard's off to the side and it's annoying. Um, that's why I've got my shortcut panel that I use. And I also have um, buttons on my Cintiq set to different shortcuts. So I'm really hopeless with the shortcut keys, the um, keyboard commands. So you might have more idea about that than me, Tanya, to be honest. Okay. No problem. I can put that into the questions panel for everyone. And there's a few sure. questions about what size canvas you're working on. Yeah, I'll, I'll show that after, before I start to um, paint. All right, I'll well, show you. interrupting you and let you move forward. Yeah, no, that's so. fine. I'll set up a canvas and show everyone how I go about doing that. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Can everyone understand me properly? I had someone tell me the other day they can't understand my Aussie accent. And I, <laughs> I've i never heard anyone say that before. So yeah, I just wondered if anyone's Nobody having a Nobody has mentioned that. And in fact, they like your accent. So no, no one. <laughs> I think I sound like a yobbo. <laughs> oh no, I love it. We all love it. <laughs> oh, okay. So I've added more to it now. And this is basically pre-colour stage. I've got to this point and now I'm ready to go to colour. I'll still change a lot of stuff in it, but um, yeah, this is the point where I start to work in colour, get away from the grey scale. Oh, sorry, excuse me. So these are some colour palette tests and it won't look exactly the same once you go to colour because of the layer blend modes that I use, but it just gives me a rough idea of where I want to go in terms of colour. And I had a few other ones as well, but this is the one that I ended up going with the top right hand one, this one here. There was some, yeah, I like the wacky colours a bit, but they just, they just didn't really fit. It didn't really work. It looked too unnatural in a situation where I felt it needed to be more natural and very earthy and yeah, being that she's fey and lives on the moors and all of that. Yep. So I went with the most basic, boring colour palette, but I thought it was the best for that situation. So this is when I add the colours at first. So I have all the elements split up into individual, it's still in individual layers. So there's a layer for Maleficent, there's a layer for her hair, 
a layer for horns, a layer for every element, the mid-ground, foreground, background, the little raven, everything's got its own layer. It's just much easier to work that way. And then I'll use, I need to put a layer on this to show you. When I first colour, I'll add like a flat base colour to each element and use Colorize. Colorize is an amazing layer mode because it doesn't affect the values beneath. So anything that you, any colour you choose on top, it will keep those values beneath. But it will flatten out the colour a little bit. So I've just touched a few areas with a few little colours just to give it a bit of life to start off with. I'll then drop that, drop the layers together, group, not all of them, but drop them onto each element. So the colour layer that I've added on top of Maleficent, I'll drop down onto the bottom layer of Maleficent. The top layer for the tree, I'll drop onto the bottom layer of the tree. I hope that makes sense to everyone. If it doesn't, I can show you. Now I'm starting to add more colour, some other details such as the grass and foliage. Um, those little flowers is a brush from Karen Bonica, a little dab brush that's amazing. It's so cool. It makes these beautiful little flower shapes. It's like a stamp brush, but it's got a lot of um, juice to it and everything. So it's very random and very, really beautiful to create little flowers. Um, Karen Bonica is from Digital Art Academy which was one of the first places I went to when I started painting digitally. Even though I'd worked as a graphic designer for years using Corel Draw and Photoshop, but it just never occurred to me that I could draw or paint in the programs beyond drawing logos and that sort of thing. I don't know why, but it just never occurred to me. And I spent years as a graphic designer and then I became really ill and had to stop working. And after that, I started to sketch and do a little bit of drawing again. And then I found digital. It was, yeah, it was just amazing. And my first program I ever used was Painter. And it, so it's just my favorite. I love it. Here I've just added a few more details, the feathers. And um, these are some new feather brushes I've just created actually. And they turned out really well. I'm going to tweak them a little bit more and then I'll have them for sale on my Q brush store too, if anyone's interested. The little, um, those are runes on her arm. I didn't want just meaningless symbols so I did a bit of research into runes and the ones that I chose, um, the top one means Fae, the next one means Dark Fae, oh, I think that one was Hunt. Yeah, I can't remember the exact meanings, but they did each have their own meaning. They weren't just meaningless symbols. Uh, yeah, I just like that. I think it adds a little bit to it, makes her a bit more mystical. And this is getting close to where I am now. 
on the poster before I add the texture. There's a bit of texture on it, but I really like going in with the thick paint brushes and adding more. It gives it a lot of, a lot of, um, I can't think of the word. Oh, someone help me, please. <laughs> I can't think. Um, Depth, maybe. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Brain dead. Um, so in this one, this is when I've added the lighting. Or oh, added more lighting. So I've added a lot of um, light to her just to really bring it all in. So she's definitely the focal point of the image and it also adds more interest. I really like working with lighting and yeah, it just beautiful cast shadows and that beautiful touch of light on skin. It's yeah, just absolutely beautiful. I love it. So yeah, so that's pretty much where I am now. So I might go into showing how I set up a canvas and all of that now, if that suits. If anyone's got any questions, go ahead and ask. I think um, a lot of the questions are going to relate to, you know, you setting up the document and just getting everything going. So I might hold yeah. on them for right now. Yeah, sure. Okay. Okay, when I set up a canvas, I'll go to new. I do have some presets, but not in this case. I'll always do the measurement by inches or usually centimetres because we use that more in Australia. But um, for this purpose, I'll do inches because most people around the world use inches rather than centimetres. I don't like to use pixel measurements because I, yeah, I need to have it the finished size that I need it to have. So when it prints to either a book cover or a poster or whatever else it's going to be, I know exactly what I'm doing and I've got full control over it. Always 300 DPI or PPI. Never ever do I use anything under that because it gives. I was in printing for a long, long time, and that is the industry standard is 300 DPI. If you use 150 or less, that's fine for on screen, on your website, anything like that. But if you really want to print your images, just start from the start at 300 DPI. Because if you start mucking around and trying to enlarge it and add pixels, it doesn't work. You can't add pixels that aren't there. And I know a lot of people say you can, but you can't. The pixels have to be there to begin with. So I'll set up my size. In this instance, it was 21 by 28. So once I've got my canvas, then I go into my, start adding my actual sketch. Um, the thumbnails I'll just do on any canvas size. It doesn't really matter because they're only getting ideas down. But now I'll start my sketch. I'll always start it on a layer atop top of the canvas. And when I'm sketching, I'm also thinking about where the text will go and make sure that I haven't got any important elements where the text will be. And usually on a poster, you'll have text across the bottom and maybe some text across the top. So you can have elements there, but nothing that's important.
Oh, sorry, just opening it up. Um, the reason I've saved saved my um, files as Photoshop is because occasionally I need to go into Photoshop to use the walk tool or occasionally, very occasionally, the clipping mask. If I've got something that's really complicated and it's not working with the selection tool, I'll go in there and use the clipping mask. And that it's really wonderful that we can interchange the programs, being able to go from one program to another and back again without in an elegant manner, it's a very elegant way of doing it. And I've always loved that about Corel when I was using Corel Draw back in the day. Um, Corel's pro, um, software has always been really user friendly and sensible, really. <laughs> Everything in it's designed to make it the workflow really nicely for its users. And I love that Corel listened to everyone. They want to know everything, they want to know how we feel, how customers feel about the software, what we need. It's really good. I haven't found that with other software. Maybe because I've been more involved with Corel, but yeah, I don't know. I just think they they listen really well. Okay, so this is where I am at the moment with it and ready to start adding some thick paint. You can see all the all the elements are still separated and I've got all the them all in groups. And it's much easier to keep them in groups, keep all your layers in groups, otherwise it can become really confusing if you've got a lot of layers like I have here. And also name them. Otherwise, you're just going through every layer looking for the layer that you need to be on. So, I've added some text to the bottom and it's not affecting anything important, it's only covering the tree. Um, sorry, just one minute, I've just got to have a drink because my voice is going. Sorry everyone. Um, yeah, so I've made sure that the text won't interfere with anything that's important. Maleficent herself, you can still see her staff there. The raven, everything's clear. As it's not a real poster, I'm not too worried about covering up that because I'll show both both images with and without the text on my social media, etc. Um, do you want to see me add some text now, maybe? And I'll show you how I go about that. Because Painter's text tools are quite good. Go for the T down the site there. Up the top you've got all your controls for it. And I'm using the transform or the yeah the transform tool to move it around, adjust the size, just grab the corners, and you can adjust the size easily. You can use any of the other transform tools as well. Uh, I've it's come up in black, so what you can do is. Um, I wanted to change the text first, so select it again, select the text, change the colour, 
white's better than in this. Oh, it's yellow. Oh, yeah, because it's covered. So I've selected white. It looks yellow at the moment. That's only because I've got the letters selected to change them. I have a lot of um, fonts in my computer, so I'll just find something a bit interesting. Bear with me for a sec. That's interesting. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to find a good font. I had some selected, but they're not showing up for some reason. It might be GoToWebinar. Sometimes okay. it messes with things. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, there were a few questions in regards of, do you always start in grayscale and move on from there? No. It depends what I'm doing. If I'm doing a big project, I tend to, because I like to get my rough ideas down with lighting and all of that in grayscale basic, basically. Um, but when I'm just sort of painting for myself, doing fun, fun things for myself, I'll just go straight to colour. Hmm, okay. Yeah. And the other thing that many people are asking, I know you offered your shortcut. Um, yes. We promoted that. And some people do not know how to import those. Okay. I can show you that. That's fine. Um, yeah. So you can change the font up there. I can't find the fonts that I was going to use, but that's fine. Um, so I've got a lot of fonts, but not the ones that I want. <laughs> it's really weird. I wonder, is there a preference for, um, does Painter only allow true type fonts or because they might be open type fonts that I chose. I just wonder, do you know that Tanya, whether they allow open type and true type fonts? I am going to have to look into that. Yeah, that's the only reason I can sort of think that they're not showing up. Anyway, I'll move on from that. It's pointless worrying about it. So that's where you change the font. Um, you can add text attributes. I don't know where that's coming up. Not coming up. Oh my god. Okay, that's better. You can add an internal shadow to it. The reason I'm doing this is because I have my palettes docked on the side there. When the whole screen's open, I can't get to the to move it up and down on the side. So if you do this, it brings that little side mover thing there, so you can move it up and down. Just trying to get this to work. Okay, that gives it an external shadow, that gives it an internal shadow, and that's no shadow. So now it's on external shadow. But it's not really showing, is it? Not sure why.
Sorry about that. I, I really don't know why that's not working. But that's basically, you, you can fiddle around with all of that. You can see it has got a slight, a slight shadow around it. See when I bring it up and you can see that little shadow around the outside of it. it sort of gives it a bit of an embossed, embossed sort of a look. I don't know, can everyone see that on their screen? Does it show? Yes, I can, I can see the shadow. Yeah, okay. Yep. So yeah, you can change all your attributes there. You can change it to a line on the left, line on the right, center it, all of that. And it makes it stand out a little bit which is what I tend to do. And when you're creating a poster or you're creating a book cover or anything like that, once you do an illustration, it then goes to a graphic designer and all they care about is their text. They don't care about the illustration. So you need to be really careful that you know where the text is gonna go because, and what text they're gonna use, if they're gonna use a white or a black, because sometimes they'll come along and if their text isn't, showing up the way they want it to, they'll add a block of um, a colour behind it. So they'll stick a big block of black behind it so that their text stands out because that's what they're worried about and that's what they care about. That's the most important thing to them. They don't care about the illustration in the background. It's all about the text and being a poster, people need to see what it is, be able to read it properly. Um, okay. Yeah, um, I have a question from Cynthia. She's wondering, I mean, we see all your brushes in the palette there, but is there any particular brush that you used for colorizing? This yeah. Painting? Yeah, I used the flat color brush, that one. Which is okay. in the fast and simple pack. Or fast and simple category in Painter. It's a, okay. where is it? I don't know. It's in there somewhere. I've got a lot of brushes too, sorry. That's why I pulled them out because I'd be, oh, there it is. Okay. You do have a so, lot of brushes. <laughs> yeah, I do. Um, I've got, yeah, a whole bunch more, but yeah. That's the fast and simple category. And there's a few good brushes in there and they work with the, GPU acceleration in Painter, which is really cool. And the performance is so much better now, it's made a huge difference. So that one's the flat colour. Um, I also like the soft glaze, that's brilliant to add light. It just brings a really nice soft light into your image. How long would it typically take you to create a painting like this? Um, I don't really time it, but quite a few hours has gone into this one. Um, probably if I was working full time on it, because you've got a lot of steps, about a week all up, and that's working pretty much full time on the one piece. Okay. And there's also quite a few questions coming in just about printing. You have a preferred printer. Um, I do. Print I do. I have um, a couple of printers that I use, but they are Australian. Um, they're fine art printers. They're not photo, photo printers as such. Um, they have like a really nice collection of different papers, textured watercolour papers and um, bamboo. They have all sorts of beautiful papers and things. And 
they're because they do fine art they do a lot of museum printing that sort of thing um so they're very very good at their job one of them's called danger fork and the other one's called hand and bone and yep they're my preferential printers and then i've also got another printer print to metal and that's for printing onto aluminium sheets and it's sublimated into the aluminium which is it's a really really cool process and your colors and everything look amazing but it all depends on the project that i'm doing i don't like to print to canvas because i just don't the colors don't come up as nicely um, and it's just my preference i guess i prefer a frame print done on a really nice paint um, paper to a canvas so yep was there anything else about printing they wanted to know not that i can see right now but there is another question about brushes and the grass in the painting which brush did you use for that uh, that was one of my brushes Uh, I think it was in the landscape pen. It's either the landscape or the concept set. I think it was that one. No, it wasn't that one. Excuse me for a minute. Sorry, I hope that wouldn't go right through the microphone. That's, no, it's okay. Oh. Do you have, when you print to textured paper, do you have to consider the texture that you add to the painting then? Um, I don't worry too much about that. No? Okay. No, and it depends on what I'm actually printing. Like if it's a you know, a more watercolory type of image, I'll use a textured watercolor paper. Um, if I really want beautiful bright colors, I'll use a bamboo or a less textured cotton rag or a satiny type of paper. It just, yeah, it just depends on the individual, but I don't worry too much about the text, uh, the texture matching the paper or anything like that. It all just looks, Good in the end and it all adds a bit of um, interest to it so sorry I'm still trying to find this brush I think it must be in the other pack Lisa asked which brush you use for the fairies too <laughs> I don't know if you know which one that was I, I just drew them just used I think it was the sergeant brush or something and I just drew them okay. and yeah and then just added the glow to them put them on screen and then used a soft probably the um the oh my god the glazing brush the um one I just had up before that I said it's really nice for light to add the um, bit of the glow around the outside. So. Yeah, so that's on a separate layer from them. And it's on a, I think it's on a screen layer. Come on. Oh no, it's just on a normal layer. Normally I'd put it on screen, but there might have been a reason I didn't. Oh, it doesn't really make much difference, that's probably why. So you just gotta be aware too, when you um have different layer modes over the top of an element, if I drop that onto and it was um, probably won't show as well. 
But if it was on, say, screen, and then I drop that layer onto the top of the little fairies. There's been a couple of questions about layers. I know that you had mentioned early on colorizing a layer, and now Joan is wondering what's the difference between a screen layer versus a normal layer? Yeah, okay. A screen layer. Okay. I'll leave it on default and I'll show you the difference. Um, I'll just grab a good pen for it. So that's a normal default layer. And when you change it to screen, it makes it lighter and brighter. So if you want to add a bit of light to something, screen's really good. And then you can just adjust the opacity. It has a more a transparency to it and also it lightens the whole lightens the layer up. Whereas your default is opaque. It's probably not completely opaque with that brush, but if I was using a more opaque brush, because that's got a little bit of um, that's still not. Ah, oh, I know why. Sorry, I'll just move it to the top of the stack. I had shadows and so now it's opaque on the default setting. When you change it to screen. It becomes transparent and lighter. Um, overlay. Overlay is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful layer. I love using it. I'll use it a lot. Um, it's also great for adding a bit of colour and light to an image. It keeps more of the colour and it interacts more with the colour that's beneath it. Um, oh, colourise. Colorize will color the layer underneath without it changing the values too much. It might change it a little bit, just very slightly, but not much. So it's perfect to use when you first go from grayscale to color. I hope that answers some questions, answers the question, hard light. Yeah, I think uh, so. There's no cool. further questions there. Um, Gregory is wondering, so how do you save the file to send it for print? Um, I always flatten it. So I'll create a JPEG or a PDF. Oh, sorry, not a PDF, a PNG. So it goes save as. Oh, or a TIFF, it just depends. So I'll use either a TIFF, PNG or JPEG, flatten the whole image and make sure the colour's right and everything's right, then I'll send it off to my printers. Okay, great. And before we forget, I know that we had mentioned about your shortcuts palette. There were quite a yep. few people that are interested in seeing how to import it. it. Yep, sure. So you go to Windows, Custom Palette, Organizer, Import. There's my Shortcuts Palette, so I just select that. Open. I won't do it because I've already got it open, but open. And that will import it into your Custom Palette Organizer and bring it up on your screen. And the difference between a palette and a box is you can add custom brushes and papers and patterns and flow maps, etc., to a box, whereas a palette is just a palette with like shortcuts or brushes. 
Does that answer the question? Okay. Yes, I think that was perfect. Cool. And the other thing is, everybody is asking, do your brushes also work in essentials? Can you do this custom palette stuff in essentials? I can answer for yep. essentials. Yeah, there's yeah, not go ahead. customization. Um, we do offer additional brush packs, but um, at this time, that's only something that's available through Corel. So it's not an artist. Artists can't exchange brushes. Maybe in the future. Yeah. I haven't used um, essentials very often. I actually only have used it because some of my um, people in my group, I've got a Facebook group, critique group, and some of them use essentials. And I've also recommended it to a lot of people that couldn't afford painter. Because I think it's yeah, a really good starting point. It is a great way to start out, and then you can upgrade to Painter from Essentials. Yeah, exactly. Oh, I'm so sorry, I can't find this brush. It's driving me crazy. It's in there somewhere. Yeah. It's, but it's one of my grass brushes. I'll find it later and let let you know if we can let them know somehow. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, sure. I, follow up and answer that question. And some other people had asked, where do they get the shortcuts palette? So I'm just going to copy the link to everyone. It's in the questions panel here. Cool. Um, I can also add that to the webinar follow up so that you oh. have the link to download the just shortcuts palette. Perfect. I just found the grass one. There you go. You did. Oh God, I put okay. it in the palette. Yeah, I put it in the palette. I'm so dumb. Um, yeah, so it's grass in my landscape pack. And yeah, okay. And it's just, yeah, a matter of. Yeah, okay. It will rotate to the direction that you go. And yeah. And it's, yeah, just make it. I'll use it and then I'll use a soft brush, I'll make a mask and then I'll go into it with a soft brush and break it up a little bit just to make it more organic because it can look repetitive like a lot of the stamp brushes can. But it's got size jitter and you can add a bit of um, color jitter to it. All right, great. Yeah, no worries. Okay, I'm just doing a quick scan. I think most of the questions we addressed, um, somebody early on, I just remember now, had asked if you had taken, I think it was life drawing classes or something like that. I don't know if you have any advice for people who are just starting out who want to create realistic portraits of people. Yeah. If you have any pointers. Yeah. Um... I went to art school. I went. I was actually the youngest person accepted into Melbourne School of Art years ago, um, and I left high school to do art because that was what I wanted to do. And yeah, I did a lot of classes there. We did life drawing. We did um, graphics. We did watercolor. We did theory and perspective classes and all sorts of things. Um, Look, nowadays there's so many options. You can learn so much just off YouTube alone. But if you're really serious about wanting to learn portraiture and become better at it, uh, there's a few different options you could go in way of classes. Um, one place that I've used myself is Paintable Academy. David Bellevue, he's amazing. And he teaches the fundamentals really well. And it's not his classes, he's got some free ones, but he's also got, um, you can join the academy for a certain amount each month. And yeah, I'd suggest if you're really serious about it, doing some classes like that is good. All right, 
Thank you. Sorry, I was answering a question. Um, yeah, that's fun. The question was about a keyboard command for resizing the brush. And I've got a Mac. If I look at my Mac keyboard, I know it's control option, or I think that's command option. You click both of those, and you drag right or left. Well, size yeah. up or, or brush. I think you're probably right. As I say, I don't use them. <laughs> yeah, so I get confused because I'm running Windows on a Mac machine, and I have the Mac keyboard. Oh, but, um, okay. Like, yeah, I, I have boot camp on here at the moment, so I, I can't test it. But yeah, control or command plus option, and you click, drag, right or left, and that should yeah. work. Um, now, I was going to do some painting. Have I got time to do that? It's gone really quickly this hour. Uh, well, we're at the top of the hour, but I think if anyone is has time, they'd be interested. Yep, if you'd like no to. Worries. Cool. So I've just selected my palette knife, which is out of my portraiture pack. And I've got a few different papers here. And it interacts really nicely with the different papers and brings in some beautiful texture. So I'll start with Maleficent. I don't want her to be have too much texture on her. So I'm using a dirty canvas, which is out of the dramatic papers, which is from Corel that you can purchase. I think Skip Allen made them, if I'm correct. Is that right, Tanya? Yes, yes, sorry. Yeah. I was trying to get off mute. That's okay. Yeah, they're beautiful. I love these papers of Skips. Really beautiful. And you can purchase them from Corel. So when you paint with thick, thick paint, it'll automatically make its own layer because it works on a different layer than other brushes. Oh, it's being a bit laggy there. And I'll... I've got a shortcut set up on my um, keys, not keys, on buttons on my Cintiq for the eyedropper. So I'll just select the colour and use colour that's in the painting. I won't add extra colour because it's already got a lot of colour in it. And I'm pretty light handed when I paint. Sorry, I was trying to keep it zoomed in so you can see better but it's driving me crazy I don't like it zoomed in like that I like to look at the whole picture sorry for a minute <coughs> oh so sorry guys it's awful yeah and I'll just work through the image adding a bit of texture. That's basically how I do it. Um, then I'll add a mask. And when you've got a mask, you can paint with white, black or anything along that grayscale, which I'll do. Sometimes I'll um, put it on a mid value there because I'll want to add. Oh, okay. Have to use a different brush for the layer mask. Um, sometimes I don't want to remove all the paint. So instead of going fully black, I'll go along the gray scar a little bit and paint into it. I think paint's great, but it can be a bit over the top, like you might not want it to be that thick everywhere. So I'll just remove a bit of a 
adjust the opacity to where I like it. Sorry, it was on the mask. So on the skin, I don't want it too obvious. So I don't want it to be too rough and too over the top. So I've just knocked that back. And I'll go all over her with that sort of a texture. Sorry, it's a little bit laggy. It must be for because of GoWebinar. Um, then I've got another palette knife and I'll show you on the rocks to how I add some texture to those. It's my palette knife from the portrait set, portraiture set as well. Um, so I've got some different papers here. Go for the old stone wall. Sorry about the lag, it's a bit annoying. And I'll sample colours again from the image. And just paint into it. It just adds so much interest to it and I think it's one of one of the beautiful things about Painter is how organic it looks and how it mimics traditional media. It's literally like having your own art store at your finger, fingertips really. And I used to work traditionally. I love to paint and draw with all, um, oils and pencils and all of that, but I really haven't done any of that since I started painting digitally, which was about three years ago, maybe four years ago. I'll add a lot more texture to the rocks because they can handle it. Rocks are rocky. And the reason I keep the navigator window open is so when I'm zoomed in, I've always got that small image there that I can look at to make sure that it's reading properly. And what I mean by reading is that when you're looking at it in a small image, like a, a lot of the time our work will only be viewed on a phone or a small tablet or something these days, you know, and to draw people in, you need to have a readability to your image. They must, you know, they look at it and think, oh, wow, I want to see that bigger screen and they'll go in and open it. So having a good read is really important. And I'll just show you too, in this image, everything that I've done is about Maleficent and coming back to Maleficent. So the tree comes over, comes down here and your eye goes down here and up to Maleficent. This tree comes around here, up into Maleficent. The mountains come down here to Maleficent. That one comes down here and it's like a roadmap and you're directing the viewer around your image to your focal point, to what's most important in it. I hope that makes sense to everyone. Do you ever use, because we have divine proportion tools built into Painter, um, I think, you know, they've been in there for quite a while. I don't know how many people actually use the, the guidelines that you can lay out on top of the image, but just so you all know, there are some helpful tools from the toolbar that you can lay over the image to do exactly what Michelle is talking about that inherently comes to her. <laughs> she doesn't have to use the tool. <laughs> um, but we do have those to help people who are just learning as well. Yeah, I'm just looking for it to show. Oh, yeah. Um, so they're up there under Canvas um, compositions and you can show divine proportions. 
Can you say that? It's a bit hard to yeah, say. Yeah, and it can be resized and moved around, <laughs> you know, flipped from the panel. So you yep. can, yeah. Where's, where's the panel for that? Colors as well, because the default colors, they're kind of hard to see with your image. So yeah. all of them can be adjusted easily. Yep. Yeah, I, I've never used them, but um, yeah, I think they're a great tool for people. And it's amazing how many things in Painter that, you know, I've got my set sort of um, the way I work and everything, but um, it's amazing and how many things in Painter I've never used. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a very deep application, and I think most people probably touch 5 to 10% of what's available in it. Definitely. Definitely. I really admire um, Karen Bonnicker and Skip. Like, they really play with the different tools and things in Painter, don't they? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they find everything and they give it a little test run and yeah, they're amazing. <laughs> yeah, they are. And the things they know, like they amaze me. And another one's Cher, Cher Pendava, she's amazing too. They just know painters so well. Yep, Cher knows it backwards and forwards. Yeah. She's, she's been with painters since the beginning. So uh, she's definitely, when we say master, she knows everything about painter. Yeah, I've known her for a while now and she's been, you know, really helpful with different things. And um, she wrote those books, didn't she? The Painter Wow books, yeah. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the other great thing is that the painter masters and the painter artists are, they like to collaborate and they like to help others. So, if any of you are looking for online education, Digital Art Academy is a wonderful place to go. Um, they it can is. you off and answer all your questions, and, and it's extremely reasonably priced as well. So, you know, all you have to do is reach out online, and so many of the masters and other artists are willing to help. So yeah, definitely. Keep that in mind. Now I've got people saying, I'm a member of DAA and yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, I've got a YouTube channel too, if anyone's interested. It's got tutorials and process videos yeah, and, and things on it. Up, um, I'll definitely add your links again in the, the webinar recording email for everybody so that you can go and visit um, and it's already 10 after the hour, so I don't expect you to keep going here, but I really appreciate your presentation tonight. I know you're not feeling well. Um, <laughs> thank you for powering through and doing this for us tonight. We really appreciate oh. it. We're thankful oh, to have good. you, Master. I hope that, yeah, you got some value out of it. Everyone got some value out of it, I hope. Um, it was the first webinar I've ever done, so sorry if I was a bit vague at times. And um, yeah, all my tutorials I've are always narrated over the top. I've never really actually done anything like this, so I hope I wasn't too bad at it. <laughs> oh no! Thank you so much, <laughs> and we'll be sure to guide everybody to your site and to your brushes and and all of that, and uh, we'll look forward to doing more with you, Michelle. Beautiful. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone, for coming. I appreciate it.